70 AD, Roman legions sacked and burned Jerusalem. Israel would remain a nation in exile for nearly 2,000 years. But in the aftermath of World War II, the people of the book returned home. Israel's rebirth and survival in the 20th century has often been called a miracle. Those who were there cite their own experiences as proof. I'm Michael Greenspan. I'm an investigative journalist. These are their stories. Jesus Christ. The year before, it was the Battle of the News magazines. Newsweek published a cover story called From Jesus to Christ. It argued that Jesus was just an ordinary guy who was turned into a God figure by popular legend. Newsweek's experts claimed that Jesus wasn't worshipped as divine until sometime in the fourth century. Now, not to be outdone, Time Magazine ran its own cover story about the Jesus Seminar. This is a group of purported scholars who have been attacking the New Testament for several decades. According to the Jesus Seminar, the Bible is filled with fictional accounts of what Jesus said and did. For example, when this group of self-proclaimed scholars examined the Lord's Prayer, they concluded that the only part of it actually uttered by Jesus were the words, Our Father. The magazine went so far as to argue that Jesus was actually the illegitimate son of a Roman soldier. This year's entry in the annual Easter parade is a film called The Lost Tomb of Jesus, another so-called documentary. It premieres this weekend on the Discovery Channel. Its executive producer is the Oscar-winning film director, James Cameron. Among Cameron's film credits are The Terminator, Titanic, and Alien. It is co-produced and directed by Simcha Jakubavici, an Israeli-born Canadian filmmaker. The film reveals the discovery of a tomb in southern Jerusalem neighborhood called Tel Piot. It's far removed from the traditional accepted site of the tomb at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Sounding a familiar theme, the film suggests that the real Jesus was married to Mary Magdalene and had one son named Judah. The supposed lost tomb of Jesus also contained the ossuaries or coffins of two women named Mary, as well as a man named Matthew and another named Joseph. How did they arrive at such stunning conclusions? Well, essentially, the only evidence they have for all this pure speculation is the similarity of names on six of the ten ossuaries to names associated with the family of Jesus in the biblical account. Everything else is merely conjecture. And from this giant assumption, they built their entire case. Now, there's real faith. They never established that the name Yahushua, found on one of the ossuaries, belonged to Jesus of Nazareth. That name in English, incidentally, means Joshua, which was a common name in Israel. In fact, all of the names were among the most common names of that time, like Smith and Jones today. The filmmakers also claimed to have isolated Jesus' family DNA. Since this was a family tomb, it's reasonable to expect that the DNA of some of those entombed would link them to the same family. So even if a, a DNA linkage is found, it establishes nothing, nada. Certainly it's not enough to disprove the historicity of the entire New Testament. 
doesn't begin to discredit all of the corroborating extra-biblical history that has been established for centuries by some of the world's leading scholars. But the most critical point which the filmmakers and the media fail to admit is this. Although they claim to have found DNA in the empty bone boxes, they have nothing with which to compare it. They simply declared that the DNA they found was from Jesus' family. And in fact, they compared the DNA found in the Jesus ossuary with that found in the Mary ossuary. Simply because the two weren't related, they considered that to be proof enough that Jesus married Mary Magdalene. What about a DNA connection between the Jesus and the other Mary? That would at least establish that this Jesus was buried in the same tomb with his mother. But nobody mentioned that particular comparison. I wonder why not. Author Regis Nichol put it in perspective. He wrote that concluding that this is the burial, the tomb of Jesus of Nazareth, would be like finding a cemetery plot in Britain bearing the names Philip, Elizabeth, Anne, and Margaret, all common British names, and concluding that this must be the British royal family. Actually, the so-called Jesus tomb was discovered in 1980, 27 years ago. At the time of the discovery, each of the 10 ossuaries contained the bones of the original inhabitants. After being examined by leading Israeli archaeologist Amos Cloner, the bones were buried in an unmarked grave in accordance with Israeli antiquities law. The coffins were sent to the Israeli Antiquities Authority in Beit Shemesh, where they languished on the shelf for almost 30 years. Then the filmmakers find this a hint of a cover-up. The implication is that Israeli authorities suppressed the information because they didn't want to make waves with the Christian community. According to the website Israeli Insider, if it proves true, the discovery could shake up the Christian world as one of the most significant archaeological finds in history. What would it mean if it were true? It would mean that Jesus Christ was not the Son of God. It would mean that He did not die for the sins of mankind. It would mean that He was not the first fruits of the resurrection. In short, it would mean that there is no hope of salvation for the world and that you and I remain in our sins with no hope. So yes, it would be the most significant archaeological find in history if it were true. According to the film's producers, their claims are based on expert opinions of world-famous scientists, archaeologists, statisticians, DNA specialists, and antiquities experts. Simply hearing that was good enough for the mainstream media. Virtually every news account accepted the claims without question. One news report proclaimed, although the cave was discovered nearly 30 years ago and the casket inscriptions decoded 10 years ago, the filmmakers are the first to establish that the cave was in fact the burial site of Jesus and his family. Apparently the filmmakers have established this as fact. That explains the headlines they set forth Jesus burial site found, ancient tomb may contain Jesus, and Titanic director finds lost tomb of Jesus. MSNBC reports that there is only one logical conclusion to the evidence found in this family tomb. If the disciples took the body, there's only one thing they could have done with it. They would have reburied it. If Jesus was reburied, his family would have waited for his flesh to disappear and then stored his bones in an ossuary, sealed away forever deep in the recesses of his family tomb. So there you have it. His disciples hid the body, then they started worshiping at the empty tomb. Knowing full well, it was a lie. The question that begs to be asked is, why? But the filmmakers didn't ask that question might have spoiled their fun in their story. And the media never asked that question. After all, if a filmmaker says it, especially an Oscar-winning filmmaker, it must be true. No corroboration required. I'll be back in a moment. 
Folks, in the light of all of the reported tonight, we've put together a very special pro package for you. It's composed of three things. It's called Answers for the Last Hour. And it's composed of a book that gives you an understanding of how to claim the promises of God, especially in critical times. It's called Faith for Earth's Final Hour. This will help develop your faith in a way that you wouldn't think would be possible. Also, it's important to understand Islam. The everlasting hatred, the roots of jihad, goes into history and does a full analysis of what is Islam, what it believes, what the Quran says, and how you can understand it today. And finally, we have a DVD or a VHS called Evidences of the End Times. All of these are designed to equip you for the things you need to know and to uh, believe to be able to have a maximum impact in these days and to have peace of mind in the process. So give us a call, 1-800-TITUS-35, and you can find out all about it. Just call us at 1-800-TITUS-35 or go to my website, howlinsey.com. As I noted earlier, Professor Amos Cloner examined this tomb in 1980. He was also the scholar who first translated the inscriptions. This would make Professor Cloner perhaps the foremost archaeological authority on the Jesus tomb. Don't accept that the family of Mariam, Miriam, and Joseph, the, father, the parents of Jesus, or, had a family tomb in Jerusalem. They were a very poor family. They resided in Nazareth. They came to Bethlehem in order to, to have the bears done there. So I don't accept it. He continued, the names found on the tombs are similar to the names of the family of Jesus, but those were also the most common names found among Jews of the first century. To cover his bases, James Cameron, the film's executive producer, cryptically told NBC's Today Show that statisticians found that the odds were a couple of million to one that the documentary's conclusions about the ossuaries were correct. Surprisingly, he didn't provide any details of the statistical models used to reach this enormous conclusion. There are lots of unasked and unanswered questions about this allegedly earth-shattering discovery. Among the most obvious is how could the family of Jesus afford a family tomb? Tombs in Jerusalem in the first century were extremely expensive, and the Jesus tomb was unusually large and therefore would have been unusually expensive. If this is the tomb of a humble carpenter, where did he get the money? Did he get an advance on the publishing of the New Testament? Then there's the question of why nobody who lived in Jerusalem at the time knew that Jesus had a luxury crypt tucked away somewhere for his whole family. One archaeologist observed that he was called Jesus of Nazareth, not Jesus of Jerusalem. Had his family owned a family tomb, it would have been in Nazareth, not in Jerusalem. The centurion in charge of the crucifixion certified to Pilate that Jesus was dead. How would the fearful and cowering disciples have gotten his body to this new tomb without arousing the attention of the Jewish authorities? All family tombs in Jerusalem had to be registered with the religious authorities. They were so desperate to discredit this new religion that when they could not refute its followers, they put them to death. All Jesus' disciples needed to do was expose where Jesus' body was hidden to escape horrible deaths. How did, this, did it escape the attention of the Roman authorities? Rome spent three centuries trying to stamp out Christianity. And most important, 40 years after the death of Jesus, the Jewish historian Josephus confirmed both the life of Jesus and the fact that he, his body was never found. Was Josephus part of the Christian conspiracy? Hardly. Why didn't his disciples recant their eyewitness testimony when they were faced with, the, with being either thrown to lions, 
crucified, stoned, or boiled in oil. It's against human nature to die for something you know is a lie. At this time of Jesus, Jerusalem was a small city inhabited by closely knit families of Jews who worshiped at the same temple, practiced the same faith, intermarried among their own families, and witnessed many of the miracles attested to Jesus. How could Jesus have lived in their midst and then be buried in a large tomb in the middle of Jerusalem and nobody notice? When the facts are examined, there is absolutely no evidence that G the Jesus tomb contained the body of Jesus of Nazareth. The only evidence is that it may have contained the body of someone named Jesus, a son of Joseph. Reliable history relates that Jesus' mother, Mary, was taken by the apostle John to Ephesus where he cared for her until she died there. Her tomb is still venerated outside the ruins of Ephesus. I visited it. The life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is routinely called into question by the mainstream secular media. The Judas Gospel, the Gospel of Thomas, the Jesus Seminar, the Da Vinci Code, all have been presented as credible alternative explanations by the media. Despite the arguments from the skeptics and God-haters, the resurrection is as provable as the existence of a Jewish carpenter from Nazareth who did many amazing works. Evidence is provided by literally hundreds of living witnesses of the time. First century Jerusalem was a close-knit and articulate society. A political criminal was convicted in a public trial and then executed in full view of thousands. That same one they called a convicted criminal was seen three days later, and he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at once, all of which went to their graves proclaiming that he was alive and they had seen him, and many died martyrs' deaths. Jesus was well known in Jerusalem. There were those who loved him and many more who hated him. Those people could certainly have confirmed or denied the accuracy of the reports of a resurrected Jesus. No one denied it. I'll be back after this important message. Each week on the Hal Lindsey Report, I try to show you how today's events are bringing to life the predictions of the ancient prophets. Like a watchman on the wall, I'm warning you that time is short. Christ will soon return for his church, and I want you to be ready to go. And I want you to see how urgent it is that you make certain your family, your friends, and those around you ready to go, too. Please help me continue this work and help me take the necessary steps to broadcast the Hal Lindsey Report into more homes in America. I need your help now more than ever before. Please send your tax-deductible contributions to Hal Lindsey Media Ministries, P.O. Box 1475, Palm Desert, California, 92261, or visit my website, howlindsay.com, and click on the Hal Lindsey Report. You know, I studied all of these things when I was in the graduate school, Dallas Theological Seminary. I majored in Greek and Hebrew and textual evidence in its history. And I can tell you this, there's more evidence for the historicity of the New Testament than there's evidence for the historicity of the accounts that Julius Caesar ever lived. Simon Greenleaf was head of the Harvard Law School for some 30 years. He wrote the laws of legal evidence in three volumes. There's still a standard reference used by our courts today to distinguish good evidence from bad. He was challenged by students to apply the laws of legal evidence to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. After a thorough study, Greenleaf concluded that Jesus' resurrection was supported by better evidence than any event of antiquity. He wrote a book on his investigation called the Testimony of the Four Evangelists is still available in most university legal libraries. It is a recognized fact that the validity of Christianity stands or falls with whether Jesus Christ came out of the tomb bodily alive three days after his death. Dr. Greenleaf wrote that the best evidence comes from the testimony of someone who admits fact that goes contrary to those of his own best interest. The Gospels show that Jesus set the religious leaders up to do exactly that. This is not something that Jesus' followers set up. 
Jesus himself threw down the gauntlet in front of his most dedicated enemies. Jesus, unlike any other religious leader in history, staked the validity of everything he taught, lived, and died for on the single condition that he would rise from the dead bodily on the third day. He bet it all on that one proposition. This more than any other factor makes the, him unique among all other religious founders. One of the first evidences to consider is whether the written accounts of the resurrection can be trusted. The very animosity of the religious leaders who forced Jesus' execution is one of the best evidences that the gospel accounts are true. We know that the message about Jesus' resurrection was preached in the streets of Jerusalem within a few weeks after his death. The religious leaders had every motive to produce evidence to disprove the message of the disciples. They could have easily ended the disciples' claims. It was only a short walk for anyone in Jerusalem to go and check out the tomb in which Jesus was buried. If they could prove foul play or produce the body of Jesus, they could have ended it all right there. Or if they could have produced the bodies of some of his followers who were killed by the Roman soldiers while they were stealing Jesus' body, they could have ended the movement instantly. Because surely Roman soldiers who knew they would be executed for failing on guard duty would have killed some of the unskilled and frightened disciples. But no such evidence was ever produced. The political ambitions of Pontius Pilate are another important bit of evidence. He certainly had every reason to end this claim if it were false. He knew that this movement would greatly harm his career if allowed to stand. This is why he condemned Jesus to be crucified after he had already pronounced him innocent. Matthew wrote his gospel, which explained what they were preaching, while the enemies of Jesus who forced his execution were still alive. If they could have disproven any fact, it would have ended the movement there and then. Here's part of Matthew's account of the events surrounding the resurrection. The next day, the one after the preparation day, the chief priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate. Sir, we remember that while he was still alive, that deceiver said, after three days I will rise again. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he has been raised from the dead. This last deception will be worse than the first. Take a guard, Pilate answered. Go make the tomb as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting the guard. Now remember the motives of each group to make certain that the tomb was secure. Jesus' enemies testified that he had claimed he would rise bodily alive after three days. Another very important piece of evidence is the skill training and discipline of the Roman legionnaires of that time. I consulted the best historical account of the practices of the Roman legions for that era. I wanted to learn the details of which procedures would have been followed in a maximum security case like this. I studied the institutes of the Roman legions by Vegetius. In such a case, they would have posted a quaternion or four squads of soldiers to each watch. So 16 battle-tested soldiers of the 10th Legion, which was one of Rome's best, were posted as guards at Jesus' tomb. If attacked, a quaternion was trained to form a square from which they could stand off an army until reinforcements arrived. By the way, this same formation is referred to in Acts 12, verse 4, in another case of the same magnitude. Another evidence is how the tomb itself was secured. When it says that they made the tomb secure, it means that first they made certain the body was actually inside the tomb. Then they rolled a large stone, about two tons in weight, into place until it dropped into a notch that was cut into the stone floor, as was the custom. The stone rested hard against the solid rock face of the tomb. The soldiers then put hot wax on the rock wall and the door and stretched a string across and pressed it in. Then they placed the Roman seal on it. 
everyone knew that breaking Caesar's seal guaranteed that the power of Rome would hunt you down and crucify you. The Roman legion's penalty for failure on watch was instant execution, so we can be assured that those soldiers did everything by the book. According to regulations, a centurion regularly checked the guards. If he caught a soldier dozing, he would first set his toga afire with his torch, then the centurion would drive a sword down the offender's neck into his heart. This tended to give soldiers insomnia. In spite of all these elaborate precautions, three days later the tomb was empty. The stone was miraculously rolled back. When the terrified soldiers checked and found the body gone, they fled. Some deserted, some went to the Jewish religious authorities and told them of what had happened and begged for their protection. The only explanation ever given by the Jewish religious authorities was that the disciples of Jesus came and stole his body while the soldiers slept. But this explanation could never stand up in any courtroom. How did the cowering disciples who hid when their leader was arrested get the courage to stand up against the Roman soldiers? What would have been their motivation? How could all the soldiers be so sound asleep when they knew it meant death if caught, if they were asleep. How could they have remained so when a two-ton stone was ground across the rock face to open the tomb? The noise would have aroused the dead. How could the disciples have the courage to go to terrible martyrs' deaths because they wouldn't renounce their testimony that they had seen Jesus alive and that he had conquered death? Not one out of over 500 eyewitnesses who saw Jesus after his resurrection recanted that testimony. Most of them died as martyrs. The very transformation that took place in Peter and the other disciples proves that Jesus must have come back to life and empowered them by his spirit just as he promised he would. Thank God Jesus is still transforming lives in the same way today. We just have to believe that he died to purchase a pardon for our sins and then received the pardon personally. I did, and now I'm certain he's alive and he lives in me. Well, that's it for tonight, folks. I realize there was a lot of information given tonight, but if you want to see this again, go to my website, at howlindsay.org or howlindsay.com, and it will be streamed very soon. And our website's really upgrading the streaming quality. So give us a look. God bless you, and God willing, I'll see you next week. You've been watching the Hal Lindsay Report. Be a part of this ministry. Write to Hal Lindsey Media Ministries, P.O. Box 1475, Palm Desert, California, 92261. Or visit HalLindsay.com and click on the Hal Lindsey Report. <laughs>